what are you doing this summer? I don't know. I'm going to be bored all summer. Me too. My parents aren't doing anything this summer. I'm going to be so bored. You don't have to be bored. What is that? They're having the Kids Connect Summer Extravaganza here at the church. What is the Summer Extravaganza? It's like VBS, but it's only once a week. But it will go on for eight weeks. We'll do crafts, games, and they'll teach us a cool Bible lesson. Wow, and they'll give us some snacks. Wow, that sounds like fun. When does it start? It starts June 2nd, and it's uh, Wednesdays nights from 6.30 to 8. And if you bring a friend, then you get to get something out of the treasure box. Cool. That sounds like a lot of fun. I really want to go. is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus all souls atoned by the blood of the Lamb I'm not a slave to what once held me damned I view that cleansing flood I am washed, I am washed I am drenched in love We're singing all oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow No other bounds I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus Whoa. shackled me how infinite that grace divine i am free i am free i am a child of god sin no oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other bounds i know nothing but the blood of the blood of Jesus. 
Well, we've got a pretty special moment here this morning for four young men. So if I could have Carson, Tyler, Lane, and Matthew join me up here on stage, that'd be great. These four young men have worked really hard the last six years, I believe, to uh, receive an award. And Dr. Lehman is going to come and share a few words about uh, how special this is and how much work it's been. So, Dr. Lehman? Good morning. Well, it's an honor to be here uh, to celebrate uh, the milestone of caravans. How many know what caravans is? How many know how long caravans have been around? A long time. And when uh, Deanna, the boss of the church, asked me to come and present these awards, I thought, this will be a great time to let you guys know. Uh, caravans was huge in my life. We started it when I was sixth grade, before your parents were born. And I have long for a reason which I could pull out my sash from my caravans day. We, ours was red back then. So I just want you to know that um, I honor you guys. I'm proud of you. To achieve the Phineas F. Brzee Award is amazing. Look at you, Sentry Scout, Trailblazer, Pathfinder. Those are a lot of badges there. That represents a lot, a lot of work. How about I give them all a big hand? And if I could ask you guys real quick, what's, what's one of the major things you've learned from your time at Caravans? What would it be? Social life. What's that? Social life. Social life has been a great place to build relationships. Good. What else? I don't know. I don't know. Spiritual life. Spiritual life. Is there a verse that you learned in, in Caravans? Yes, Tyler. That's all on you. Did you learn like Luke 2.52? And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. That was like the motto of the theme verse back when I was there. So I just want you guys to know that as district superintendent, I'm proud of you. I'm, this is a great milestone and it's awesome. And Pastor Jake is going to give you all and why don't you introduce, introduce them all because um, I'll forget your names. That's all right. So we got uh, Carson here who's worked really hard for his Brazil Award. Congratulations, Carson. Next, we have Tyler Mash. Tyler, congratulations. Good job, man. And Matthew Camp. Matthew, congratulations. And finally, Lane Graves. Congratulations, Lane. Good job. Good job. So. Well, thank you all for uh, congratulating them. Y'all have done a lot of work to uh, deserve that, and we're proud of you. And uh, so, great work, and uh, we'll let you be seated. Good job, guys. Good job, guys. All right, one quick announcement for you. Our children's department is having a fundraiser this evening. It's going to be walking tacos, and uh, so you'll just come, and, and they'll serve you. Um, so if you'll be here at 5 o'clock tonight for that. And depending on the weather, it'll be inside or outside. So uh, they've got a plan for both. So come and enjoy some tacos and support the kids going to summer camp. You are who you say you are. You'll do what you say you'll do And you'll be who you've always been to us Jesus Our hope is in you strength in your mighty name our peace in the darkest day remains Jesus and this we
And we hold on to every promise you ever made. Jesus, you are unfailing. Our guide through the wilderness and our joy in the heaviness all mysteries revealed, and away is swept the curtain from joys which are now concealed. If to die is to greet all the martyrs and prophets and sages of old, and to joyously meet by still waters the flock of our own little fold. If to die is to join in hosannas to a risen reigning king, and to feast with him at his table on the bread and wine of his board. If to die is to enter a city and be hailed as a child of its king, O grave, where soundeth thy triumph? O death, where is thy sting? Today we remember those of our church family who have gone on to their heavenly reward. We begin today by remembering Bill Hall. If Julie and the family would please come forward. Go ahead. Bill was born in March 9, 1949 
and left this world November 18th of 2020. Bill was a faithful member of Calvary Church for 47 years. He enjoyed being a member of the church choir and singing in various groups throughout the years. He served on the church board most of his adult life and headed up the facilities committee for many years. He attended Bethany Nazarene College and in 1973 started up Hall's AAA Roofing, which is he owned for 47 years. Bill was generous in giving. He was steady and calm in any circumstance. His attitude was always positive and his smile was genuine. He loved his family and grandchildren, his church and pastor, but most of all, Bill loved the Lord. And we certainly miss Bill today. Thank you, family, for being here. You may be seated. Next, we remember Betty Campbell. And I do not believe any of her family could be here today, but she was a longtime member at Calvary. Next, we remember Bob Ogden. Again, his son could not be here, but Bob was uh, born September 28th, 1925, and passed away December 11th of 2020. With the coming of World War II, many young men were eager to enlist, and Bob was not to be left behind. At the age of 17, Bob joined the Navy, hoping to become a cook. He was instead posted to a destroyer escort, the USS McNulty, as a radio man first class and was later promoted to a radio man second class. He was married to Dorothy for 65 years and had two sons, Bob and Mark. And we definitely miss his smile and beautiful attitude. Next, we remember Flossie Pound. If your family would please come forward. Flossie was born January 14, 1923 and passed away January 12th of 2020. Flossie was always available to help others, and she was a long, long time member here at Calvary. Encourage young folks, bring food, and open her for, home for parties and gatherings. Flossie had an eighth grade education. She was a housewife with seven children. Three of her children are here today, or two of her children. Um, and she was later a cook at Calvary's Kitty College when they had the daycare here in the church. And then was the janitorial service at SNU cleaning for the music department. She cared deeply for others and encouraged them to succeed as Christians in life. And we remember Flossie today. Thank you, family. <laughs> Next, we remember Shelley Muldoon. And again, family could not be here, but she was a gifted teacher. I credit her with helping my son to make the moves he did in his education because she realized what it took to challenge a child and was a great teacher to him. And she was also a pastor's wife. Next, we remember Shirley Hayward. If her son and family would please come forward. <clears throat> Shirley was born April 10th of 1940 and passed away August the 8th of 2020. In her earlier years, Shirley loved to sing. She would solo, participate in duets, trios, quartets, and choirs. She taught Sunday school. She was a Sunday school superintendent and NYI director, among other things. She was best known for cooking Wednesday dinners for the church. She also gave faithfully for missions and participated on several work and witness trips. In her early years, she worked as a switchboard operator for Ma Bell. Besides being a mother of five and a homemaker, she ran the family business of laundry and dry cleaning. She was very skilled at clothing alterations. Her family says that she was a great mother, wife, daughter, aunt, and Grammy. She loved God with all her heart and trusted him. She lifted her family to him in prayer every day and was a good friend to many. Thank you, family, for being here. prayer to remember our families. Let's pray together. God, we come to you this morning and we think about the legacy that, that exists here in this room. We think about these incredible people who, who lived full lives, who had so much to offer this world that, that gave of themselves and, and richly just blessed their families, Lord. But 
But it's more than that because we know that they loved you. And so, Lord, we celebrate today. We celebrate the lives that they lived and we celebrate the peace and the, and the glory that they find in you. So, Lord, as we think and remember the legacies of these incredible people, we, we just offer our hearts to you and say, Lord, do in us what you obviously did in them. And God, as we turn our eyes to the, the young men that received this Phineas F. Brzee Award today, we think about the legacies that are just beginning. Lord, help us as a church to continue to be steadfast in our giving of our knowledge and our love for these young people and for this world. Help us to follow in the footsteps of these great saints who have gone home in this last year to bring your name to the forefront of every mind, to bring your praise to each lip, and to stir in one another love and good deeds. We love you this morning, Lord, and we pray that you would be in our service. We pray that you would do whatever it is you want to do, that you would speak through Dr. Lehman, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would stir us toward you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, well good morning again. It's really an honor and privilege to be here. Um, oh, several, I don't know, maybe a month or two months ago, uh, Deanne had asked me if I could be present to help with the uh, honoring of the Phineas F. Brzee Awards. And at the time, I had a previous engagement. I was supposed to preach someplace else. And I got a phone call earlier this week, asked me if I could reschedule. And so in my mind, I thought, I can't remember when uh, I was supposed to help out with uh, the Brzee Awards. So I called, called Pastor Jim up and said, I can't remember when your wife said uh, what Sunday. And I got a message back. And she said, it's this Sunday. She wants you to, to present, be there for the awards. And she also wants you to preach. So I've learned when the boss says do something, you do something. So uh, it really is a privilege to be here and an honor to celebrate this day. And let me just tell you as a church family, what a, what a blessed service you've already had to honor young men who have made a milestone and to celebrate with families who have walked through a grieving period. What a, what a hard time. And I, I was just looking at that. I think what a blessed church family that you would love and intentionally affirm somebody who's gone home to be with Jesus and as difficult as that is. So uh, thank you, Calvary family, for loving people and investing in them in the whole journey of their lives. It speaks to you. It speaks to your heart. And uh, it's also a reminder that in between, <laughs> there's a lot of lives, a lot of people, a lot of families that need the encouraging word of Jesus Christ. And so um, it really is a joy and a privilege and an honor to, to be here. And so I pray that the Lord will just uh, guide our times. I have to reflect back to my own childhood. And I, I say that because part of who I am was shaped in that one year that we had started caravans at Anaheim First Church of the Nazarene. I mean, in that moment, I fell in love with lots of things. I, I, I remember the verses we had to memorize. Luke 2.52, Proverbs, in all thy ways acknowledge him and... You must have been in caravans too, or some point, right? I remember the campouts. I remember the energy. I remember the Pinewood Derby stuff. I remember all the things that created this community and gave me a love for the church. And I remember the people that at that time were looked a lot like you, who loved and invested and gave, and you doing a fundraiser for camp. I can't tell you how important camp was in my life. So keep on doing what the God has called you to do as a church. And I affirm you and I celebrate with you. And I also remind you that this Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. And, and I heard the church celebrate. Amen. Oh, yes. By the way, I'm, I'm very interactive when we preach. Y'all going to have a good time, all right? Pentecost Sunday, you, you know a little bit about that, but before we jump into this reality, I get back to the fact of why we're here in the season we are. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I will build my church and what? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
And if, and if hell can't prevail against the church of Jesus Christ, that which Jesus creates, nothing will. Unless we decide not to be the church of Jesus. And that's, that, that would be a bad idea. God's called us into a wonderful life, a relationship with Jesus Christ, a life redeemed, restored, set free from all the sin and the hurt. A life that's not defined by the struggles, but defined by the Savior who walks with us in the struggles. A life that's not defined by adversity, but in the advocate, our Savior who walks with us in adversity. Hey, we're making it through. We've been through some tough times. More tough times are coming. But God is able to make all grace abound. Amen. So that in all things, we'll have what we need. And so we come to this Sunday called Pentecost Sunday, and we say, okay, why do we celebrate something? Why do we look back at an event? How many of you still celebrate birthdays? Come on, reach your hand. All right, I'm looking, I'm looking good. Why do you do that? Because it keeps you reminded of a special person on a special day when your life was changed because they came into your life, right? And the older we get, we can't think of gifts for our loved ones as much, but we just love them more and more. And so why do we celebrate Easter? Well, because we know that on that sometime, Jesus really did resurrect from the grave. He conquered sin. The cross was not victorious. Jesus was victorious. The tomb was empty. And so Jesus had this season from the resurrection to this moment when he ascended into heaven and to this day we call the day of Pentecost, a day that birthed the church, a day that brought hope to hopeless people. I mean, if you can think through your life and, 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 and realize that oftentimes we are a people that let circumstances get the best of us. Now, yeah, don't understand. I understand that life is life and it's, it's difficult at times. I was just thinking through all of you that uh, received a memorial roll certificate and a rose in honor of your loved one. I, I, I know that coming up brought back the memories. Maybe it was a painful journey. Maybe it was a sudden death. And we walk through the grief and, and we know it's difficult. And, and sometimes we, we get this idea that, well, just because we're Christians, we, we should not feel that. No, we should feel grief. <laughs> we should feel loss. Because that's when the Savior comes in and walks with us. Because we are people of hope. The resurrection is a reminder that we are people of hope. And Pentecost is the exclamation point that God's hope is always present and real. And he's never given up on us. There's a great statement by an author named Bob Goff. Bob says this, Grace means tomorrow is always a friend and yesterday isn't an enemy anymore which means because Jesus has conquered death, because God has given us his Holy Spirit, each day is not a day to be afraid, but it's a day to walk with the living God who loves you. I'm reminded that um, the prophet Isaiah, in the midst of some dark times, spoke the words that said, forget the former things. Forget 2020. Don't dwell on the past. Don't look at how you messed up. Don't, don't let the loss of your lives define where you're headed. The Lord says, see, I am doing a new thing. It's springing up. Do you see it? Do you see it, he says? And so we come to this day of Pentecost, this, this event it was certainly an event that the Jewish people understood, but it's the event that shaped the church, birthed the church, defined the church, brought us to a new place of what we were going to. So turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. You know, there's something about the light right here. I don't know. It, my eyes have a hard time reading these small scripture letters. Anybody else like that? Yeah. So I'm just going to do this. Just kidding. I don't know where my glasses are. Verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. 
Suddenly a, a, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in the tongues as the, as the Spirit enabled them. Now where they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Hmm. <coughs> By the way, you'll You'll see that phrase, every nation under heaven, again in the scripture. Judgment day, new, all these things. When they heard the, uh, the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all of these men who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each of us hear them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, members of uh, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya and Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and, and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Anybody ever ask in your life, what does it mean to know God? Get ready. That's why Pentecost is here. Because God takes people like you and I and empowers us with something profound that shapes eternity. Somehow we're made fun of them and so said they, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose, only nine in the morning. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Lord, may these Brazil Ward winners see visions of your glory, Right? See visions of what God can do in young people. Amen? And your old men will dream dreams. Hey, us older people, never give up on God. Never give up on what God can do in you and through you. He's got something fresh in your life. That's what he does. He's God. Even on my servants, both men and women. Hallelujah. Men and women. God says, I'm going to do something in you and through you. I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I'll show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Say that with me. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Raise your hand if you've called on the name of the Lord. Hey, you just testified to what the power of God does. He saves you and everyone. But I've had a rotten life. Good news. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. But I don't really get this Jesus stuff. It's okay. Call on the name of the Lord. You'll start getting it. Because he'll save you. Jump over, if you would, to verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to their hearts and said, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off. Don't raise your hand, but I wonder if there's somebody in this room today who has a loved one who's far off from the Lord, far away, not walking with Jesus. Don't give up. The message is still for them. Keep on believing, keep on praying, keep on trusting Jesus and everyone who's far off. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves. Those who accept his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number daily. Wow. I, I, I'm probably certain that you've heard this passage before. Maybe last year at Pentecost Sunday. Maybe you hear it every year or maybe you remember it. It's like, okay, that was then, this is now. 
Before I jump to the now, let, let me just kind of remind you of what this was then. I mean, because th this is a really, this is an Old Testament festival. People aren't just showing up because, hey, let's go to Jerusalem because I think the Holy Spirit's coming today and I want to get me some of that. They weren't there for that. Therefore, because of Pentecost, the, the Feast of the Weeks, the feast that was set forth in to celebrate the provision of God. So people from all over of Jewish background have gathered there. The city's full of people. And they're in, the, they're in the room. They're praying. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes up. Let me just kind of connect some Old Testament with New Testament reality. What happened in the Old Testament and how God made something new. This, I'm doing a new thing. Isaiah 43 thing. In the Old Testament, you go back to Genesis. Remember Genesis? They have the Tower of Babel. What happens? Everybody starts, they can't understand. They're speaking different languages. What happens? Fellowship's broken. They all depart. Here we come to Pentecost. Holy Spirit gives what? The ability to understand. Why is that important? Because God makes it possible for people of different backgrounds, different cultures, different races, to all have community together, to have fellowship, to have unity of purpose through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. That means you and I can have totally different lifestyles and maybe even have a different background, different language, but because of Jesus, the Holy Spirit makes it possible that we can get along. Right? We don't have to disagree about things that matter. It's Jesus. And therefore, what was taken is now given back. Say, yes, you can be one because the Holy Spirit's come. Wow. But what if I don't like that other person? Too bad. You have to love them. Because he loved you first and says, love that person. And I'm going to make it possible that you can get along with each other. I won't go any further for that. I'll let Pastor Jim pick up those messes for you. Second, Pentecost was also the, the, kind of the celebration of the giving of the law. It became this, this time to reflect and to celebrate that God gave the Jewish people the law. The feasts were given to celebrate God, but the law was given how to love God, how to worship God. I know sometimes you read through the, old, the, the first five books, the Pentateuch, and you get lost in Leviticus and you scratch your head going, why in the world are these there? And God was telling his people, here's how a holy people worship a holy God. It takes a lot of work. Oh, man. And so Pentecost was reminded the law was given for us to be a holy people in relationship with God. Here comes the Holy Spirit. And God said, I will write the law upon your heart, Jeremiah. I will give you a new covenant. Not one of stone, but one of spirit in you. And so we have now what the God's word is in our hearts that you can personally and intimately know God. Isn't that great? Oh, man. Here's the third thing. The Old Testament, Pentecost was a feast to celebrate the first fruits of the harvest. Thank you, God, for the first fruits of the harvest that we can give back to you. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes, we see the first fruits of the kingdom of God. People who come to faith believing in Jesus and are set free and made new. And the church is born. That was then. What's it mean for us today? What does that even talk to us about? Why, why is Pentecost important? Well, it's critical. But let me, go, let me take you back a chapter to chapter 1 of Acts. And I think you need to, to, to look at this as the reason, as Jesus setting forth why Pentecost is so critical. In verse 1, Luke, who's writing the gospel account, says, In the former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. That's the gospel of Luke. And giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he, he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave them convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my spirit, my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? The question was, Jesus, is everything going to be back to, to what it was? 
Are you going to things, return things back to, to normal? How many have asked that question this last year? And Jesus saying, uh-uh, I'm making a new normal. Whoops. Uh-uh, it's not going to be what the kingdom of Israel, it's about what I've got planned. And he says this, it's not to you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. In that little passage, we get to experience and receive what Pentecost means for us today. Number one is this. Pentecost means that God's promises are fulfilled. Promises are fulfilled. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised. Jesus was saying to the disciples, when you get the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes on promise, on Pentecost, you need to know that that is a promise of God made real and fulfilled, and you can trust God that his word will never return empty, but all of his promises, as Paul says, are yes and amen in Jesus. Oh, come on, church, you can do better than that. Amen. Promises. Anybody ever been on the, the end of a broken promise? Oh, man, I tell you what, nothing worse as a parent than when your child says to you, but Dad, you promised Oh, Lord, forgive me for those moments. And, but thank you for giving me the quickness to say, okay, you're right. Let's go make it right. But maybe it's been a broken promise in your life that caused pain. You never thought the marriage was going to end. You never thought that things were going to end the way they did or turn out the way they are. And so we oftentimes live in a world where promises are so destroyed, not taken for granted. Who do we trust? A promise is all about who do we trust? Can we trust that person? Can I really agree that I'm going to believe that that person is going to have the best interest for me? And Jesus said, you're going to receive the gift my Father has promised. And because my Father has promised it, he will deliver. And that gift will be what you need and what every person needs. It's my Holy Spirit. And you will receive it. How are you on your trust level? The Bible is full of promises. And sometimes we wonder, okay, God, when, when will you show up? When, when will you fulfill your promise? God, when will life get better? I'm trying to remember where God promised an easy life in the word. Not there. In fact, Jesus said, in this life you'll have trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. That's a promise. There's a promise I'm, I'm holding on to. Found in Revelation 21. And to those of you who, who are here for memorial roll, this is your promise. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Pentecost is the promise of God fulfilled. We serve a Savior who does not go back on his words. We serve a Savior you can trust. We serve a God who's on your side. We serve a God who loves you enough that he would give Jesus to walk with you in the midst of your pain. So my prayer for you today is, are you trusting Jesus? I hope today that you will leave with a better trust of our Savior. But Pentecost is not just the promise fulfilled, but it's also the presence of God realized. Think about that. The presence of God realized. Jesus has told his disciples it was better for him to go away. Can you, can you stop for a moment? I, I, I mean, when the disciples were with Jesus, everything was cool. They saw miracles. He did things that was amazing. He fed, fed people. They were like, I'm hanging out with you, Jesus. Because where you go, good things happen. And I'm better with you there. But Jesus says, no, no, no. It's better that I go away. Why? As he said in John 14, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. 
Can you, can you think for a minute, maybe you've, you've had Bible studies or maybe you've had conversations, you've read the Word, and you came up with all the different names that Jesus had for the Holy Spirit. Helper. Anybody ever need help in their life? <laughs> Counselor. Oh, Lord, I need your mind today. Comforter. <laughs> Advocate. I just need somebody to be on my side. God, I'm with you. Lord, you're with me. Intercessor. Those are awesome words. But Pentecost means that no longer is God worshiped from afar, but God has come to dwell in you, in me, so we would know him and he would walk with us. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to know these songs that are, well, we sang when I was a kid and still love them. There was a, a song that goes something like this, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. And he tells me, I am his own. You know what that's about? That's the promise of the presence of God with you, even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I am with you. It's Pentecost. We got a God who's with us, in you, with you, surrounding you, talking to you, wanting to be present in your life. Don't ignore him. Don't ignore him. I got on my, <laughs> my phone this morning and it gave me an update on how, many screen, how much my screen time was this week. Isn't that kind of a scary thought? How much time I spent on my iPad or my computer or my phone? And then I thought, Lord, maybe you should send me a reminder of how much face-to-face -face time we had. I mean, we got God with us, but we kind of ignore him. <laughs> hey, don't do that. Let's, let's not ignore the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. It's the presence of God. The, the, the comforter is not YouTube. The, the comforter is not Facebook. The comforter is the Holy Spirit who dwells in us because his presence is realized. Hallelujah. Hey, do you ever feel alone? Start talking to Jesus out loud. Start talking to him. Have that conversation. One of the realities of Pentecost is that God's plan for restoration is put in action. When Adam and Eve are cast from the garden because they rebelled against God, broke God's heart, Pentecost is God coming in back into us to dwell with us, to restore fellowship, restore the right relationship with God. Third thing that Pentecost does for us is God's power is supplied. What did Jesus say? It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Now we look at that word power and it's, it's abused. We misunderstand it. I mean, the news is filled with the word power. Everybody's vying for power. Power gives control. Power gives the ability to tell others what to do. That's not the power that God's talking about. The power God is talking about is the power to live over sin, the power to live over self, the power to live in right relationship with God, the power to say yes. It's the power to sing praise when life seems bleak. It's the power to love people when people are not really lovable. It's the power to bring reconciliation and restoration to a broken world. It's the power to face temptation, which you will, and say to Satan, not today, I choose Jesus. It's the power to make choices to bring life and not destruction. It's the power to walk in relationship with God. Jesus 24-7 and not ignore God's greatest gift. You shall receive power. It's going to be there. God's given it to you. And then Jesus had told his disciples in John 14, one of, the, one of the scriptures that I always found so, Jesus, what did you really mean by this? He says, I tell you the truth, everybody. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Time out, Jesus. How can we do greater things than you? 
Well, he's on earth in one place. Those of us following Jesus, Jesus is in you. There's a lot of bodies of Jesus right here. A lot of hands and feet of Jesus. Don't think of great things in terms of the power, the, the, the enormity of it. Jesus doesn't ask you to go fight, feed 5,000 people. He's asking you to go love your neighbor. And maybe, maybe they need to be fed. Or maybe you need to have them over for dinner. He's not asking you to go out there and walk on water. <laughs> He's just asking you to walk over to somebody who needs the comfort of the Savior. And when we all do that, Jesus was right. <laughs> it's better that he went away. Because he's not here in one place. He's everywhere we are. And the church, I'll build my church, and hell itself won't stop it. We are to be empowered like Jesus. I, I, I've always loved the story of Acts chapter 3. From Pentecost, we go to Acts chapter 3, and Peter and John, they're at the temple gate, beautiful. And what do they do? They see a, a crippled man who says, hey, uh, give me some money. And Peter says, hey, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Remember that song? <laughs> Bible says walking and leaping, he's praising God. Of course, the next chapter, Peter and, and John are called before the Sanhedrin because, hey, you're doing some miracle stuff that looks a lot like Jesus. Stop it. We got rid of Jesus. We don't have more Jesus stuff happening here. It says this, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. You know what that means? That the power of the Holy Spirit means you've been with Jesus. And when you've been with Jesus, people take notice. Because it's not a holier than thou attitude, it's I'm here to serve like Jesus. I'm here to love like Jesus. What do you need? I don't have your silver gold, but stand up and walk. How can I help you? How can I love like you? And the Pharisee said, these are just ordinary people. Guess what God does? God takes ordinary people like you and me and gives us his Holy Spirit and says, now go, look like Jesus, act like Jesus. And the world will say, wow, they look a lot like Jesus. Hallelujah, church. Pentecost Sunday. Lord, let the fire fall. Let it happen. The power. Let me give you one more thing. Purpose defined. Pentecost defines our purpose for life. What do you mean by that? I thought I was called to be a pastor. I thought I was called to be a doctor. I thought my purpose was, no, here it is. Jesus said this, and you will be my witnesses. Whether you're a doctor, whether you're a teacher, whether you're on vocation, whether you're retired, whether you're a student, when you come to faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit fills your life. You are filled by the power of the Holy Spirit. For what purpose? To be a witness of Jesus. Amen. To be a witness of Jesus. Listen to me very, very carefully, church. I say this with a heart of compassion. In our world today, we are called to bear witness to the things that we love and value. Do not let anything be a greater testimony in your life than Jesus Christ. Never let your political affiliation come before Jesus Christ. Never let your hobbies get in the way of Jesus. Never let, your, uh, not, never let anything. Our purpose is what? You will be my witnesses. You will bear witness that I'm real. You will say to the world, hey, they, they've been with Jesus. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth, Oklahoma, Bethany. I've noticed something about living in Oklahoma now for eight months. There's a church building on like every corner. But I've also noticed that there are a lot of people in the park and every place else and not in the building. Your community needs you to be a witness of Jesus. At school, at work, wherever you are, you be a witness of Jesus. Peter and John said, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. See, we live in a world that can't stop hating each other, can't stop posting negative comments, 
Can't stop being caught up in self-fulfillment. Can't stop being so divisive. And Jesus says, I need you to be a witness of me. I've come to bring healing. How, how, how are you doing in that? How's the Holy Spirit helping you? See, on this Pentecost Sunday, let me give you one last thought here before I wrap up. We are not done. We all have our part to do. We're still the church. We, we, we don't get to stop being a witness of Jesus until our names are called in the memorial roll. Right? We don't get to stop being witness of Jesus. We don't get to stop loving people, reflecting Christ. Why? Because if on that first Pentecost, 3,000 people were added to their number daily, I guarantee you that there are more people being born on this earth than are coming to Jesus on a daily basis. We're not done. We're not done. So yes, Pentecost is the celebration that God's promise is fulfilled. His presence is realized. He's with us. His power is supplies. You can live victoriously over sin. You can walk faithfully with Jesus. You can love people who are unlovable. Your purpose is clearly defined. My purpose to bear witness that Jesus is real. So church, today you get to do your part. And as that first Pentecost Sunday, the Spirit filled the believers, I'm going to pray over you that the Holy Spirit would empower you with a fresh vision of what it means to bear witness to Jesus. That this day, that this week, you'll see every opportunity, not to preach at people, but to love them and to be present in their life and to let your life show that you are a believer in Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to take a moment and just ask you to to be honest with the Lord. And maybe if you'd like to come and come to the altar and pray, please do so. Holy Spirit was present then. Holy Spirit's present now. And as followers of Jesus, we're always listening to what the Holy Spirit's trying to tell us. So maybe this morning, God has laid somebody on your heart and you can't get them off, get that person off your mind. Maybe it's a call to, to reach out to them. Or maybe this morning God's shown you that you, you've been putting things above Jesus. You need the Holy Spirit to purify your heart. Or, or maybe, maybe you're here this morning and uh, you just want Jesus to do something new in your life. You need this Holy Spirit to just stir your heart. You want to come and pray, you can. You want to stand and pray, you can. If you want to kneel where you're at, you can do that too. But I want to pray over you this morning that the Holy Spirit would just fill your life fresh today. Jesus, we come this morning fully aware that we are people so overwhelmed by the glory of God, Lord, that you are amazing, that you have come, that in your death you conquered sin, Lord God. In the resurrection you brought life out of the tomb. You gave us hope. And in Pentecost, Lord, you came to dwell in us that we can live and walk with you. Father, some of us in here, we, we, we feel like it's been hard to trust you. Lord, for any who have had a hard time, God, would you just remind them that you will never go back on your promises. Lord, that you're with us in the midst of life's struggles. That's your power, God. It's not power to control. It's power to love. It's power to say yes to you and no to sin. It's power to become like you, God. It's power to walk to a neighbor and say, can we be friends? It's the power to look at people who are broken and say, I know someone who can help us. Can I talk to you about what Jesus has done in my life? So, Lord pray you just fill each and every person, God, right now. Holy Spirit, come upon each person today, God, and empower us with a fresh vision for our purpose in life, God, for your glory. May your name be exalted. 
In all things I pray, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He must hold me fast He will hold me fast He will hold me fast For my Savior loves me so He will hold me fast Those he saves are his delight, Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight, he will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost, his promises shall last. Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. For my life he bled and died, Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied, he will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life, he will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sight When he comes at last He will hold me fast He will hold me fast For my Savior loves me so He will hold me fast he will hold me fast, He will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so, He will hold me fast.